Well, today's guest is part of the 75-person team heading to Australia, one of our biggest ever teams, to represent our track and field team for Australia at the Paris 2024 Olympics. She'll be running in the 4 by 100 metres relay, and it is a great pleasure to welcome Ebony Lane to Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans, who deal with anyone in Australia. They've got clients in every capital city, and they can do Zoom as well. Ebony, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Hello, thank you for having me. Where do we find you two weeks before the Olympic Games? At the moment, I'm in the UK and I head to Belgium on Friday and then I come back to London for the Diamond League with the relay team as well. Right, so it's all about your last minute preparation. How are you feeling going into the Games and how important are these races late in the campaign to get you 100% ready? Yeah, good. I feel like most of my work was done in the Australian season, which we finished that back in April. So it's been a long time to sort of keep on going, um, but I gave myself the opportunity to do that last year before the World Championships and sort of get an idea of what I needed to do when I did come over here this time around. So yeah, all of it's just the last minute preparations, keeping myself race fit. And then once I meet up with the girls for the London Diamond League, that's when we'll then start to work on our changes a little bit more and just perfect everything ready for the Games. So have you had a chance to train together much in recent times? So the last time that we trained together was before World Relays, which was in May. Right. And then all of the rest of it has just been our own individual training. And then we'll be back together next week uh, for a relay camp leading into Diamond League. So, and how often have you run together in, in big events? So our team for this year has run together four times. Right. And apart from that, we're all racing against each other in the hundreds. So, um, yeah, together as a team four times this year. And, um, yeah, we've done multiple camps and stuff for many, many years all together. But the four, team, like the four of us as a team has been together for this whole season. What's it like running against each other when you know you're going to be teammates come London? You obviously know each other pretty well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, very well. And yeah, as I said, we do lots of camps like all throughout the year together. So we've actually created such a good bond and relationship with each other that when we do race against each other, we do know that it's sort of just get the job done and then we're all friends afterwards. The biggest challenge was at Sydney Track Classic this year where we had to do the relay together and we broke the Australian record and then pretty much an hour later, we all had to then race against each other in the hundreds. So that was a little bit interesting and a bit of a challenge to sort of go from being all happy to then being competitors, but um, it's all a part of the sport. So, yeah. So you had to get your game face on pretty quickly, delighted that you've broken the record and then thought, well, yeah. hang on, I've got to try and break another record against you in, in, less, than hour, in less than an hour. Now, tell me, in regard to where you run in the relay, is it the same positions or does that depend on the day, on the conditions, on the opposition you come up against? You might be the first runner one day, the second runner the next day, et cetera. Yeah, so over recent years, we have all sort of changed and been in different positions. I mainly go first because I'm usually the first person out of the blocks in the 100 metres. So I have like sort of got myself in a position where I'm always first. This year, we've kept the same order and I think that it's really helped and it's worked for us to sort of just always be passing to the same person or receiving from the same person. And that's just allowed for us to just have a little bit more trust and confidence going into each race, knowing our position, who's passing to us um, and all those sort of things too. Sprinter Ebony Lane is joining me. She's part of the 4 by 100 metres relay at the Paris Olympics, which kicks off shortly. And we're here for Aussie Home Loans, Dashing Downs Olympic Adventures. Areas of expertise for Aussie Home Loans include purchasing a property, occupied invest investment, building a property, refinancing, debt consolidation, cash out construction, pre-approvals, first home buyers, equipment loans, car loans, and personal loans. Obviously, in the lead up to the games, you work on your baton changes, but how important is that when you have a lot of relays that you will be running, that the baton changes become a big part of your training? So compared to other teams, especially like USA and Jamaica, who pretty much just rely on all of their speed to get them get the baton around. 
for us, it's a little bit different and to really nail the changes and make sure that we're spending as less amount of time as possible getting from one person to the next is what allows us to get closer to those teams that are usually at the top. Um, and I feel like that definitely helped us to position. Uh, we came fifth at the World Relays this year in May in Bahamas. And I feel like because our changes were all perfect and we spent as less time as possible getting the baton from one person to the next, that allowed us to be yeah, a force to be reckoned with and to make sure that we were sort of really close to those teams that usually are up there at the Olympics and World Championships. You bring up a good point there because the Jamaicans and the USA, I mean, they wouldn't run with each other and realise it all until the final probably because they're looking to win a gold medal. So they wouldn't have a lot of experience on the changing of that. And so in, in a lot of ways, as the member of an Australian team up against them, you'd be hoping, uh, dare I say, that they, they might mark up one of the changes. Yeah, definitely. And if you look really closely at the videos of their changes, they're not good. So, um, And a lot of the time, that they're usually the teams that do end up dropping the baton or running out of the box and not even having really much of a team environment either. Um, yeah, because they just don't really have many like camps and changes like what we do. And we put a lot of time and effort and I guess money into making sure that our relay teams are just as good as them. And by doing that is just making sure that our passes are perfect. Ebony, it's your first Olympic Games. How much will you feed on that experience last year in the Diamond League where there were 50,000 where you'll have a similar sort of crowd for your relay race? How much will that help you? Oh, it'll help immensely. Like last year going into that first Diamond League at London where there was 50,000 people, I had never run in front of probably even 500 people before. So that was a yeah, massive experience for me and um, such a learning curve. And I think if I didn't have the, that experience last year, I probably wouldn't go into the Olympics as confident. But that's really made me realise um, that that's sort of the world stage that I want to be at and I want to be in front of that amount of people and it's exciting and it's a great opportunity and it's something that I'm excited to do again um, and this time at the Olympics, which is really special. Going back three years ago, of course, it was just after COVID and there was a period there where you all had to train on your own in 2020. Did you think you'd be able to get to Paris by 2024? And if not, where do you think you've improved in the last three years to get that opportunity to represent this team? Yeah, so that was actually the year that I had like my breakthrough season in the 100 metres. So I was able to get my time from 11.80 to 11.39 and that was purely just working hard in lockdown, relying on my own motivation and yeah, just really sitting down with myself and working through my mental health and also physical health and got myself to a really good point that I was able to go from one extreme to the other. And I remember sitting and watching the Olympics in 2021 and I was like, this is where I want to be. I didn't think that it was actually going to ever happen, but um, especially going into this season, I've had the best season of my life and I've run PBs pretty much every single run that I've done this year. So I knew that I was in a really good position to be able to make the Olympics. And once it got finalised, it wasn't really a shock to me. But yeah, it's always been something that I've, Never thought would happen, but I would have hoped that it would happen. And, yeah, watching the 2021, I was really hoping that that would be me going into this Olympics. And, yeah, once I got that phone call that I had made it, it sort of just made everything feel very surreal and, yeah, just exciting to get there and to have the opportunity. And hopefully it's the first of many Olympics that I'll be able to be a part of. Sprinter Ebony Lane has joined you. She'll run on the 4 by 100 metres relay at the Paris Olympics for Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans. So even though a lot of us were feeling sorry for ourselves during lockdown in 2020, we couldn't do much. You could do exercise on your own. In hindsight, perversely, was that one of the best things that happened to you, having to train on your own? Yeah, absolutely. I think when I was going through my teenage years, I got myself involved in the wrong crowd and lockdown really allowed for me to step away from those friendships and to yeah make me just really sit down with myself and be like what do I want out of life do I want to go down this path or do I want to keep on continuing being an athlete and focusing more on that 
And once I'd made the decision to go 100% in on my athletics, it just completely turned my world upside down and it was probably, yeah, definitely for the best. And since then I have uh, still been able to keep my mental health and physical health just as good as it was back then. But that was definitely the turning point for me to really just be like, all right, do I give it up now or do I go 100% in and see where I can take it? And, yeah, it obviously paid off, so can't complain. Do they go hand in hand, you think, if your mental health is going well, your physical health is going well? Does that help? I mean, at the end of the day, you can't help if you break a leg. You can't help if you break an arm. Hammies are a little bit different, which no doubt a lot of sprinters do suffer from. But do you believe that if your mental health is as good as it can possibly be, your physical health will follow suit or vice versa? Yeah, definitely. And I think there is going to be some years where it is going to challenge you a little bit more. And that's the only way that you're going to learn and grow as a human being is being able to push through those hard times and to go through those moments. And once you come out of it and you do get yourself in a really good position, that's when I feel like all of your goals and dreams do start to happen. You started at a very young age. You're from a family of beach sprinters. You grew up in Echuca. When you first started running, was it all about running as fast as you could for an adrenaline rush? Yeah, I think so. And look, I've done all of the different sports and um, different disciplines in athletics as well because when you start in little athletics, you've got to do every single event. So there was a time where the long jump and triple jump was more my thing and there was even times when the cross country was more my thing and I think it wasn't until I sort of got to about 15, 16 years old that I started to really enjoy the sprints and could see that that was probably more my best event. And then doing other sports, I tried to give AFL a go and I actually tore my ACL and the surgeon sat down with me and said, look, if you ever want to play football again, you're going to have to have the surgery. But if you just want to give sprinting like a chance and to just stick with sprinting, then you won't need to get to the surgery with the ACL. And that's what we made the decision based on was just to not get the surgery, see how I went with my 100 metres and I still run with a torn ACL and it's been torn for eight years now. And, yeah, it's what sort of restricted me to give up even the jumps and um, even the cross country because I find that the more that I run, the more, like, knee pain that I sort of get. So just doing runs for quick periods of time and to do all of that, it doesn't give it any issues. And that's probably what made me really stick with the sprints at the end of the day as well. I read that and I, I couldn't believe it, that uh, you've torn your ACL, but you're able to run 100 metres. Again, you said it's it, it's all about the short distances. Does it help too that generally it's in a straight line as well? You hear about footballers, netballers, that if they have to turn, if they do their ACL, uh, forget about, uh, playing until you actually get it repaired because you won't be able to turn and in those sports you need to turn and even go 360 in some examples but in your sport you can just run in a straight line for short distances yeah yeah and I found the first couple of years I wasn't even able to do uh, runs on the bend so that is primarily what I do in the relay is starting off and I do run the bend uh, when I first did the ACL I wasn't even able to run on the bend so it's just been through hard work in the gym strengthening all of the muscles around it there's still some exercises in the gym that I can't do based on yeah the different turns and um, force that goes through the knee but yeah we've just been able to work around it and strengthen everything up and make sure that yeah when I am running in a straight line and even now on a bend it's completely fine so yeah does that have a lot to do with the fact that you're very strong mentally, that you can cope with, as you say, there's not much pain, but do you think because you're strong mentally, you can put that pain to the back of your mind and and forget about it in the moment where you are competing? Yeah, absolutely. And like, I don't get too much pain now. As I said, I did eight years ago, but even a couple of weeks ago, I did have some knee pain there. And I know that it's just temporary and it's not going to last forever because it hasn't. So yeah, it's, Something that I'm obviously always going to have to deal with until I get the surgery once I've finished my athletics career. But yeah, for now, it's just something that I always have to deal with and it doesn't give me too many issues. So we just, yeah, push past it as if it's just a little niggle. <laughs> You're amazing. Most people would be, wouldn't be yeah. struggling to recover. I know a few AFL footballers who play at local level who've done their knee and have kept playing, but not many don't. 
Ebony Lane is my guest. We've got over 25 lenders on the panel for Aussie Home Loans, who are the major sponsor of Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures. And Ebony will be representing Australia in the 4 by 100 metres relay at the Paris Games. Do you know much about the stadium, Ebony? I mean, have you had a chance to uh, read up on it? I presume you haven't run on it yet. But then again, if it's full like the Diamond League was, it'll be very similar, won't it? Yeah, definitely. And uh, I know that they've relayed the track and it's completely brand new just for the games and they've made it purple. So I've never run on a purple track before, which is pretty exciting. Something new. And now that I've got access to all of the emails and everything coming through as being as a part of an Olympian, I can see there's a lot of things in the village that I didn't think were going to be there, like uh, hair salons, nail salons, movie theatres, um, so yeah, it'd be very exciting and I've just started a YouTube channel. So going to be taking everyone along and sort of show the behind the scenes and what things are in the Olympic village that people might not think of or think that there would be there. So yeah, I'm excited to see what it's all about. And it's going to be, a, again, a new experience, completely different to the world championships last year, apart from the crowd, we're going to have all of the other things and it'll also be a challenge to sort of make sure that you are staying, um, ready to go, ready to race, and the 4x100 relay is actually at the end of the program. So just making sure that, yeah, I am sticking to plan and making sure that I'm ready to go when the time comes for us to run our relay. So you remain confident that you'll be as focused as you need to be. As you say, it's at the very end of the program with the athletics. So I believe the next Olympic Games, it'll be athletics, then swimming. For these games, it'll be the the tried old formula of swimming, then athletics will be at the end of the program. Pretty confident. There'll be no issues there in the lead-up? No, I don't think so. I It's been a goal of mine all year. And I've, as I said, I've been able to run some of my fastest times this year back-to-back. And even on that uh, weekend of the Sydney Track Classic where we did break the Australian record and I, we did have to run the 100 metres an hour after, I was able to run a PB like as a personal individual event anyway. So when it comes to yeah being focused and um, staying on my game, it's something that I've finds that I do really well and I think I'll be able to carry that through into the Olympics as well. You talked about being an Olympian for the first time and getting all the emails about what to expect in the village. When did it hit you? When you thought, gee, I'm actually going to the Olympic Games. I'm being given all these emails as an athlete. Was there a moment where it really hit you and thought, wow, this is real? I knew all along this season that I was going to do it, especially because the times that I was running, it was no doubt that I was either going to go for the 100 metres, which I actually missed out by three spots in making, or it was going to be the relay team. So always this season, it was on my mind that, yeah, it was definitely going to happen. And um, especially once I made that world relay team and it was a part of the four and we broke the Australian record again, uh, it came pretty surreal that that would probably be the team that they would select for the Olympics. But it actually probably didn't hit me until Monday when I was able to announce that I had fully been selected. I found out last Thursday and we weren't able to announce it to the public until Monday. And I think Monday, just getting the response from everyone, family, friends, even people that I don't really know, that's when it really hit me that I actually am going to the Olympics and I'm an Olympian now and I'm going to be representing Australia at the Olymp- my first Olympics. And yeah, hopefully it's the first of many. You're very close to your family. No doubt you would have spoken to them between Thursday and also Monday. How tough was it not to tell them? (laughs) Yeah, so I actually was allowed to tell them on the Thursday, which was good. I feel like I wouldn't have been able to keep it from Uh, them for that long. Fair enough too, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but even they said the same thing, that even though they found out on Thursday when I did, it probably wasn't until Monday that we actually were able to announce it, that it really felt surreal and um, that it was happening. You've said all along that your parents have been your greatest supporters. What does it mean for you to be able to make an Olympic Games, knowing how much support they've given you over the years in your journey to become the sprinter you've become, Ebony? Oh, they've been a massive part of my journey and I think that they are the people that help me sort of get through and to run the times that I run because they're always there to support whether I've had the best run of my life or whether I've had the worst run of my life. They're always going to be by my side and have always helped me through the toughest of times and the greatest of times and 
it's never something that we thought would ever happen to have an Olympian in the family, whether it was just our immediate family or extended. We are quite a sporting family, but we've never had anyone make the Olympics before. So, yeah, I'm just, like, really keen to do them proud and to be the first Olympian in the Lane family. And, yeah, they're always going to be here to support me no matter what. And, yeah, if it wasn't for them, none of this would even happen. So, yeah. Are they going over? No, unfortunately, they're not. It's so expensive um, yeah. for this Olympics, but they're hoping that um, if I make the World Championships next year, it's in Japan. So we've got a few family friends that actually live in Japan, so we're hoping that they'll be able to come then. Um, but, yeah, they'll all just be watching from the TV at home this time around. Have you been to Paris, the city of lights? Do you know much about it? Yes, yeah, so I actually went a couple of months ago. Um, I had a race in a city in France and we went to Paris for the day. And yeah, it was just interesting to see like a lot of it was shut off and they had started to build some stadiums around the Eiffel Tower and throughout the city. So sort of was able to experience a little bit of it before I was even going as an Olympian. But I know, I'm sure that it's going to look completely different when I am there in the village and uh, walking around the streets and it's all going to be blocked off and mainly just for us athletes. So, yeah, it'll be different to experience it being a tourist a couple of months ago to then an Olympian and being a part of the village. My guest today on Dashing Games Olympic Adventures is Australian sprinter heading to Paris for her first Olympic Games to represent Australia in the 4x100 metres relay with Bree Masters, Ella Connolly and Tori Lewis. Looking forward to seeing how they go in the Olympic Games in a few weeks' time. Can't wait to see how they go. And uh, we're here, of course, for Aussie Home Loans on Dashing Downs Olympic Adventures. They deal with anyone around Australia. They've got clients in every capital city. And they also do Zoom like uh, Ebony and I are doing today. So no doubt yourself, Tori, Bree and Ella have got different personalities. What makes you a great team? Uh, I think we're a great team just because we all trust each other. We all have a job to do. It all is a part of our job at the end of the day. And um, we know that once we get on that track and we've done all of the hard work behind the scenes, whether it is individual and making sure we're as fast as possible individually and then also with all of our exchanges at our relay camps that we do throughout the year, it really builds a really good trust and bond between all of us. And once we get out on that track, we're all... Yeah, such an amazing team and we all trust each other and work really hard. And um, yeah, outside of the track, sometimes we all don't hang out together and sometimes we do. Um, but yeah, once we're a part of a team and we all do have a really special relationship and bond, so we all get along really well, which is nice. You need to be great friends when you're in a relay team or when you're in a sporting team, do you think? Or, or do you just need to be able to get on, especially in the big moments? Because we're all different, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Everyone's got different, um, like, think hobbies and interests outside of athletics. And yeah, as I said, if you if we don't hang out outside of athletics, it doesn't really matter. Once we're in athletics, we've all got the same passion, we've all got the same interests and the same goals. So coming together and sharing that bond and interest and being a part of a team and making sure that we do our country proud is also something that we're really passionate and wanting to do at the end of the day. So yeah, definitely once we're out on the track and a part of relay teams and everything, we do have a really great bond and get along really well. Um, and then outside of that, yeah, it just depends on who you get along with and who has the same interests and hobbies to whether you hang out outside the track as well. Now, as part of your apprenticeship, if you like, you ran a couple of stall gifts in the 70 metres and 120 metres. How did that prepare you for life as a, an athlete, as a sprinter? Yeah, the store gift is such a good event and I think it does really prepare you for these big events um, once you do sort of get past that um, pro level. So, yeah, it was definitely a stepping stone for me to sort of get to a higher level of athletics and having the cameras and the interviews and everything that comes with the store gift of making the final, which I was able to do two years in a row. Um, and it really yeah, gave me an insight into how it's sort of going to be if I did want to make um, athletics a career of mine and something that I wanted to do at a high level, which is something that I'm doing now. So, yeah. Then when you changed to track, excuse my ignorance here, was there much of a difference from running or training on grass as the store gift is? It's uh, one of our most famous sprinting events in this state and in this country to going on the track full time. Did you have to adjust much? 
Yeah, definitely. I think uh, it is a completely different um, aspect of athletics and track and field. I was always doing track um, on the side of doing stall gift as well, but the stall gift and the VAL, the Victorian Athletic League, definitely does give everyone an opportunity because it is all handicapped. So at the moment in time when I wasn't the best or wasn't making state finals or anything on the track, it gave me an opportunity and something that I was able to do really well in because of the handicap system. And it really pushed me to work hard and to yeah, be able to chase down people who had bigger handicaps than me. Um, and then once I sort of had made those store gift finals and was getting faster and faster on the track, that's when I was then able to let that side of the track and field and athletics go and to just mainly focus on the 100 metres on the track. Do you think if you didn't do the store gifts, you maybe would not have had the the big trajectory in your form and improvement that you've had? Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, that style of running, and it's great training no matter what, and we still do some of those events every now and then just for training purposes. And, yeah, when you're running, uh, like, trying to catch up to people and especially on the on the grass, you're not running as fast as what you would on the track. So it's really good training, and I think it did really help my top speed um, when it did come to then transitioning for the 100 metres because the store gift is 120, which I always found quite hard because I am such a shorter distance specialist. Um, so yeah, it was great training and it really helped my top speed leading into then just sticking to the hundred meters on the track. It's a big team. As I mentioned at the start, 75 athletes going, it's great for Australian athletics, isn't it? Because it's been a sport where maybe we haven't performed as well as we'd like, but we seem to be heading in the right direction. Lots of chances in the middle distance events, lots of chances in both marathons for men and women, obviously the, the, uh, the field events looking pretty good as well. So uh, it's a team without putting too much pressure on them, all about personal bests and maybe some medals along the way too, Alan, when you've got so many, um, Ebony, I should say, when you've got so many uh, athletes, it gives you a chance, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. And even with all of the Diamond Leagues that have just started up and seeing all of the Australian athletes and how well that they're doing, we definitely have chances for many medal, many, many medals and um yeah it's exciting to see and now that i've been a part of the australian team last year at the world championships and this time around at the olympics i have become quite close with a lot of the uh, athletes whether they are field events or long distance distance events so just being able to support them and watch them in the individual um, events is going to be exciting and yeah just make it really exciting to watch your friends not just people that you know uh, out on the track as well was it like when you first represented Australia? How nervous were you? And uh, did you feel like you were welcomed straight away? Yeah, I had been a part of the relay squad uh, for, I think, about four years before oh. I even got a chance to run in the A team. So I was always sort of in that B team or like reserve. Um, so last year was actually the first year at the London Diamond League that I was able to run in that A team. And it was my first ever time running in the A team in front of 50,000 people. So it really put a lot of pressure on me and it was a massive challenge. But once I stepped out onto that track and I got a really good start and all of the nerves sort of went away as soon as I did get into the block, that made me realise that, yeah, this is where I wanted to be and that the representing Australia out on a world stage was something that, yeah, I never thought that would happen. But once I was out on there, it actually felt like home. So I knew that it was, yeah, definitely something that was always meant to happen. And it was just waiting for my time to come. Ebony Lane is my guest. He's part of the Australian Olympics team, athletics team. She'll be running in the four by 100 metres relay. Look forward to seeing her on the track late in the Olympics of 2024 in Paris in a few weeks' time for Dashing Downs Olympic Adventures, Fozzie Home Loans, their areas of expertise include purchasing a property, occupied of investment, building a property, refinancing, debt consolidation, cash out, construction, pre-approvals, first home buyers, equipment loans, car loans, and also personal loans. So how do you make sure that you do not run the race too much in your head, especially at an Olympic Games? Oh, it's massive. You, if you get into your head, like you're already sort of setting yourself up for failure. I think nerves is always going to be a part of being an athlete and you use it as a bit of motivation and energy to get you through your event. But if you're getting in your own head and yeah, putting the doubt in your head, then you've already 
already sort of failed. So just trusting in your training and what you've done all season. Um, we've all we've done a lot of relays together. So just trust, trusting in the team and um, in all of the training sessions that we've done together. And that's what's going to get the job done. Can I ask another stupid question? I'm sure I've asked a lot of stupid questions to you today. You must be thinking in the back of your head, God, this guy asks a lot of stupid questions. When you run your leg, and as you say, you generally run. There'll be people out there that may not know the answer to this. I certainly don't. And mm. as you say, you generally run your leg first. What do you do then? Do you have to go to the side of the track? I presume you do, don't you? I mean, you're obviously egging on the rest of your team, aren't you? And and how are you feeling as soon as you finished your leg? I mean, are you relieved generally? Yeah. So once you sort of pass off the baton, you generally chase the person who you're sort of running out to um, just to cre create a bit of momentum and also just a bit of hype as well. We start to yeah, get really excited and we're yelling at them to like do really well in their leg and cheering them on. And then once you sort of have gotten to a point where you've sort of slowed down a little bit, that's when yeah, you step up to the side and then you walk all the way back around to the finish line. And then that's when all of our team sort of then meets up together um, after the race. Once you pass the baton off, it is a massive relief that, yeah, okay, the baton's, like, my job is done. My part of getting the baton to the next person is, yeah, all good. Um, and then you're just hoping that the rest of the legs are all perfect as well. And then once we all meet each other at the end, that's when we're either celebrating that we've done a really good job or we're getting around each other because we might have missed the baton or um, missed running out of the box and those sort of things too. So, yeah, always just meeting each other at the end and, celebrating or yeah consolidating there's a lot there's a lot to worry about in a short space of time isn't there making sure you don't run out of your lane making sure you pass off the bat and making sure you run as fast as you possibly can even a personal best so how do you compartmentalize i mean again you have been very good with your mental health in your mm -hmm. mind as well as making sure that your body's okay when you're running to get all those aspects right yeah there's so many aspects when it comes to a Really, I think it's completely different to running at 100 metres because you're just needing to focus on yourself and getting out of the blocks and just getting to the finish line, whereas the relay, there is a lot of aspects and especially for me, running on a bend, which is something that I usually don't do. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's getting a good start, running in the bend and staying in my lane, getting the baton off properly, making sure that the person is hopefully taking off on time. Um, that's a big one as well staying in the box and then yeah just making sure that every other change is perfect as well so there is a lot that comes with a relay and it can be quite stressful um but again at the end of the day some people are going to have really good races and some people aren't going to have the best of days either and it just that's what it yeah takes to be an athlete and to be a part of a team there is going to be people that are going to do really well in the team and some that aren't going to have the best of days and it's just making sure that, yeah, we all get around each other and supporting each other no matter if we have run a really good time or if we haven't made finals or made the baton around. Who will you pass off to and what do you generally say to them? Um, uh, before, I mean, you do say, as you said, once you've passed the baton off and the adrenaline's still pumping and you run a few metres with them, keep going, you're going well. But what do you say, I'm here? Or they know you're here because they've got their hand outstretched behind you? Yeah, so uh, the process with a relay, we've got um, a exchange box and we set a marker from outside of the exchange box to where that person is going to take off. So, again, the person that's taking off needs to take off on time on the marker that they've set out on the track. So let's just say it might be uh, 30 steps. So from the first exchange tick, they take 30 steps out on the track and then they'll put like a sticky tape on the track. So when I'm coming around the bend and I hit that marker, Bree, who usually runs second, she will take off when I hit that marker. If you take off a bit earlier or later, it can stuff up that change a little bit, but making sure that you take off on time when I hit the marker. And then once I run in close and I have a good free distance, that's when I'll then call hand and she'll put her hand out and then making sure again that the hand is nice and firm and a good target for me to hit. And then that's when you push the baton in and then they start to run off and then you start to yeah, cheer for them and everything like that. And who, who's the third runner, Ebony? 
Yeah, so the order that we've done this season has been uh, me first, into yep. Bree second, into Ella for third, and then Corey for fourth. Righto. Now, if you make the final and you come up against the Jamaicans and the Americans, mm-hmm. and I know you don't want to look too far ahead, have yeah. you <laughs> thought about who you might be running against for the first leg? Because I presume what they generally do is they have the two fastest runners first and last, certainly the Americans and Jamaicans do that. As you touched on it earlier, there's no science in how they do it. Just get the fastest runners out there and provided the bat and lands in the hand, we're away. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for world relays, like we did go up against those teams, but a lot of them had their like second or third teams that they usually have um, for Jamaica or USA just to give their main, in sprinters arrest because that was back in May. So that was a bit of an experience and it was still very nerve wracking because I think the girl that ran the first leg uh, ran 11.33 and then the next fastest was like 11.60. So wow. um, over that first, yeah, over that first leg, 11.33 is, yeah, moving really quickly and that was only their like reserve team. So they're definitely going to, when it comes to realize they're definitely the top of um, sprinting and you know that they're always going to put their best team forward and um, it is going to be nerve wracking and you're going to have to race against those people, whether you do run it in the relay or individually anyway. So I think just, yeah, trusting in your own preparation and um, your own team. And I think if you let those other teams sort of get in your head or you get nervous around them, then it's going to show on the track. Um, So just, I just like to focus on, okay, this is me in lane six. Our Australian teams in lane six, that's the only team that I've got to worry about is just getting that baton and getting to them. And if we run faster than them, then we run faster than them. If we don't, we don't. Um, I usually try and block out the people that are ahead of me and the people that are behind me and just really focus on me and the lane and try and even, yeah, there's a, when it comes to visualisation and being an athlete, uh, it is quite easy to sort of block those lanes out and they almost become a blur and just focusing on your lane, which is... Um, yeah, whatever lane that you get given on the day. Because you can't be intimidated, can you? If you're intimidated, there's uh, half the battle lost in a lot of ways, isn't there? Yeah, for sure. And the those top sprinters, they do like to try and get into your head a little bit in the call room as well. They like to make really? lots of noise. Yeah, lots of noise and they shout. And even on the start line, a lot of the girls like to scream at the top of their lungs before they get into the blocks, which is something that us Australians don't really do and it can be quite scary. So... Um, I think, yeah, just focusing on yourself is the only thing that you can really do. What are they screaming about, Evan? Uh, I think it's it's just a part of their routine. They just scream at the top of their lungs and, um, yeah, it's just what they do. <laughs> really? Like yeah, a- so I think it's just uh, it's either to yeah get a bit of adrenaline out or to get themselves focused. I'm not too sure, but, yeah, a lot of sprinters do – like to scream at the start line and yeah, it's quite loud. <laughs> what do you think you need to run to ensure that Australia can make the final? Time wise. If we run yes, yeah, so if we run how we did in the world relays where we broke the Australian record, um, the final is easily reachable. We came fifth at the world relays in the final, so um, and we'll be going against most of those teams again this time around. Uh, most of their teams will send their better teams, but even still, like we're in a really good position to make the final and um, even could potentially medal if we do break the Australian record again. So, yeah, like we've had really good success this year. We've been able to get the baton around every single race that we've done. We've been able to break the Australian record twice. So if we can break the Australian record again, then the final is definitely there and um, yeah, we just have to make sure that we're all fit and ready and um, confident on the day and it will happen. What would it mean if you won a medal? Oh, crazy. <laughs> Especially like, yeah, like being first Olympics, um, it's all of our first Olympics actually. So oh, none of us girls have made the Olympics before and um, all of those girls are doing individual events as well. And then once we come together for the relay at the end of the program, I think it will just be icing on the cake if we do medal and it will be something really special, especially because none of us have made an Olympics before. So the other three in your team are all going to be running what? 
the 100 and 200. Is that right? And you're, and you're just running the relay. Is that right at this stage? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Bree and Ella have qualified for the 100 metres and Tori yep. has qualified for 200. Yeah. Um, I missed out by three spots for the 100 metres. So, yeah, I'll just be going for the relay. And then we do have a few other reserves that are coming for the relay as well just um, for backup. So, yeah, if ever needed, that we do have reserves and they do step in when they're needed um, if one of us can't run. But I think the other girls having their individual events at the start of the program will really help us um, by the end of the program and give them enough um, break and rest to be able to be ready for the relay too. Makes it a bit harder on you because you're not running until the very end. Actually, you've, you'll be doing plenty of you'll be doing plenty of practice, but you're not actually and training, but you're not actually running until the very end. So you've just, as you said a bit earlier, uh, you've just got to remain focused, don't you? And and maybe spend some time supporting the girls and other members of your team, as you also touched on. Yeah, definitely, and. Australia does it really well. We send our team in two waves. So the first, the girls will actually go in the first wave to the Olympic Village and I'll stay at the staging camp um, in France and fly out a couple of days later. So in that aspect, it's really good because it does allow you to stay focused in that staging camp and to continue your training um, that you've been doing the two weeks leading into the Games. And then, um, yeah, I'll then meet the girls in the Olympic Village a couple of days after they've run. So tell us about the staging camp. Uh, how far is that from Paris? And predominantly is a little bit like an Australian Institute of Sport or something along those lines? Yeah, so it's actually the France Institute of Sport and we did our oh. staging camp before World Championships there last year. So the exact same place. Um, I know, yeah, what all of the facilities there are like and um, the track's really good there and we get really warm weather. And, um, yeah, so we go two weeks in before the Olympics start. And as I said, they fly um, – or well, they get everyone in from two waves. So the people who are at the start of the program will go in for the first wave of um, the athletes that will go in together and then people at the end of the program go for the second wave, which is what we did at World Championships last year as well. And, yeah, it just gives the people who are in that second part of the program to stay focused and to be in an environment that we've been in for the previous two weeks and um, continue some really good training. And, yeah, as I said, we've got all of the facilities. We've got all of our physios and massage therapists that are based there as well. So we've got everything on hand and um, it, yeah, prepares us really well for when we do go into the village. This is Dashing Downs Olympic Adventures podcast for Aussie Home Loans. My guest today is Australian sprinter on the 4 by 100 metres relay near the end of the Paris Olympics. We can't wait for it for 2024, Ebony Lane. So obviously at the moment, athletics is taking up most of your time. I believe you've done a bachelor degree in early learning childhood. What else do you like to do when you can take a break from athletics? If you can take a break yeah, from sorry. athletics. <laughs> Yeah, so I did work in um, yeah child education for three and a half years. Um, I stopped that about four years ago um, to focus on more on athletics and to start my career in being a fitness coach. So I now have my own online fitness coaching company, which again is really good for me to be able to split being a full-time athlete and also an online coach, um, just being able to work from wherever and um, yeah, make it fit into my schedule where I can because it is all online. Um, so, yeah, I love being able to be a fitness coach and to sort of give my knowledge of being an athlete and a coach across to other people, whether it is general public or whether it is people in their own um, discipline of sport and, yeah, helping them through to achieve their goals in whatever aspect that it is. And, yeah, it's something that I'm really passionate about and work really well of being a full-time athlete and also online fitness coach too. And Ebony, you said you'll be setting up a YouTube channel. We look forward to seeing that during the Olympic Games of your adventures, which will be fantastic. Are you concerned, though, that people still go too far? That they, We hope that everyone is complimentary of the Australian team, encouraging of the Australian team, just to make an Olympic Games um, is a fantastic performance. We can't stop the trolls out there. How concerned are you? with the way social media is going uh, in regard to people being so critical and generally being able to get away with it because they hide behind their keyboard. Oh, uh, it's something that I feel like you just, it, 
becomes a part of it no matter what you sort of do like social media is always, always going to be there and always always there is always going to be those trolls and I think yeah if you just learn to shut out the people who aren't going to give you encouraging feedback and um, the ones that are always going to be there to support you and to encourage you and yeah I think because I have had such a big social media presence the last couple of years and um, been yeah at the world stage and everything now I do know how to juggle it quite well and um, I think for those who don't struggle with it as well as others um, they usually decide to just completely switch off um, social media when they are in those sort of camps and um, Olympics and world championships and all those sort of things. I know a lot of them just go completely cold turkey and just won't even log into those sort of things. Um, so, yeah, it just depends on how the individual can cope with it. But you're okay with that. Yeah, you're, you're used to it. How have, yeah. you <laughs> to be, how have you managed to be used to it? You seem like you've got a very positive disposition. Is that because your family's always had a positive disposition that's been ingrained into you? Oh, I grew up with three brothers, so I right. feel like I always say to people I'm tough-skinned because of them. <laughs> Are they older or younger brothers? Uh, one older and two younger. Right. So, yeah, life would have been interesting at times, wouldn't have it? Yeah, a lot of, like, wrestling on the trampoline and, um, yeah, having to play football and basketball with them um, as fun. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it was a lot of fun. Now, if yeah. you get a chance, is there an event you'd like to go and watch outside athletics at the Games? Uh, yeah, there is a few. Obviously, um, like I don't really go and watch much sport because I am so invested in athletics and I would love to go and watch most of the athletics because there's a lot of people that I know now that are going to be competing and I um, encourage them. Definitely like swimming, obviously, that's a massive one for Australia, so seeing some medals won there. And I think even, yeah, as I said, I grew up with three brothers. So going and watching things like the boxing and the weightlifting is something that I actually would be interested in doing. So again, it would just depend on the schedule and where it sort of fits in with where I'm running and how long I'm even going to be in the village for. I'm not too sure. So yeah, just taking it day by day and just seeing where it's going to fit in and especially with my own training and everything as well. I hope your brothers didn't use you as weights or or used you as an opponent in the boxing ring. Ebony, I'll be disappointed with that. <laughs> there was a lot of broken bones growing up. So, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Well, I really appreciate your time. I wish you all the best. Can't wait to see how you go in the 4x100 metres relay in the track and field with your teammates, Tori Lewis, Bree Masters and Ella Connolly will be right behind you. Uh, it's a great achievement to be at your first Olympic Games and thanks so much for joining us today on Dashing Down's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans. Your areas of expertise include purchasing a property, occupied or investment, building a property, refinancing, debt consolidation, cash out, construction, pre-approvals, first home buyers, equipment loans, car loans, personal loans. And they've got over 25 lenders on their panel and they deal with anyone around Australia. They've got clients in every capital city and they do Zoom as well, like Ebony and I have done today. Ebony, Great to chat and uh, all the best in Paris. We'll be right behind you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks.